Hi. Okay. My name is John LaBelle, and I teach at PIC. And first I want to say uh, thank you to Alex. And I've been to almost all the PIC lectures, and what an incredible bunch of people. I mean, I, do other schools have this kind of creativity available? So what I'm going to talk about is digital genomic fabrication. So let's see what that means. So first, a bit about me. Teach at Pratt, online courses at Build Academy, studied at Penn, was an environmental sculptor, worked on interesting office on interesting projects. I'm director of research for TimeShip, a next generation cryonics facility, which puts me in touch with websites, my lectures are on YouTube, and I'm going to say something interesting about these two books in a few minutes in terms of our topic. So what I do in the course is look at how whole cultures derive from technology and how visionary creatives generate these cultures. So, for example, mechanistic culture, we have Galileo, Newton, and uh, School of Athens. Electric culture, looking at Maxwell's fields along with Van Gogh and digital genomic culture, and I'll define that as we go. So, how do we make things? And there may be four great eras, handcraft, and then the beginnings of industrial mass production. And they kind of tried to make the product look like it did when it was handcrafted. And we get to the Bauhaus, and they said no. We should have a totally new design for an industrial era, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. Who can tell me what this is? Michael Graves' teapot for Target. And it's in this tradition, and designed by a designer to be mass produced so that we ordinary people can have a work of art. And we're now entering an era of 3D printing. I put 3D in quotes because it's much more complicated than that. But each of these produces an entire culture. Think of Karl Marx talking about the material means of production, or McLuhan talking about the medium as the message. So industrial production is still with us. Here's Henry Ford's assembly. And here we are making smartphones pretty much the same way. And it was for that era that the Bauhaus came about and we still, <laughs> the MoMA store has this lamp. It says, economical Bauhaus lamp, $900. <laughs> and don't try to buy a real one, because they're incredibly collectible. But that was not the idea. The Bauhaus was not making things for you to buy. They were prototypes for mass production. And now I'll pause a moment on this slide. I remember when this was brought home to me in school, of what the Bauhaus was. <clears throat> so Walter Gropius observed that industry is replacing craft. Industry produced poorly designed products and put craftspeople out of business, but what they made was affordable. The craftsperson, so Gropius said the craftsperson should become basically an industrial designer. So I'm saying that for all of design. Because we architects design for something that's going to be produced industrially. Instead of making one thing to sell at a high price, the industrial designer makes a design or prototype that can be economically mass produced and conceptually gets a small royalty on each one. So education moves from crafts and historically based art. Famously, Gropius locked up all the history of art books. No one was allowed to see them because we were making a revolutionary break from the past. And education moved to basic design and industrial materials. So you studied wood, metal, fabric, and the industrial processes whereby they were made. <clears throat> this changed the entire culture. But that was all 100 years ago. So what would be appropriate for today? And I'm going to get to what this is. But basically, we're manufacturing things 
out of nothing. So there's a model for that, DNA. So 1953, Watson and Crick decoded DNA, figured out the structure, which is this thing. And there are four letters and two rules. A, T, G, and C. A and T can link. G and C can link. 20 parts, amino acids. That's all you need. All of life is made out of four letters, two rules, and 20 parts. Does that suggest something? So here is John Conway, who invented the game of life, which is a cellular automata. And this is a brilliant book about the game of life, how it developed, all how it unfolded. And this is something took forever to make. It's a glider gun. So game of life is in a grid, like the grid we see here, and then rules for how these black squares are going to iterate. Unfortunately, the grid's not shown here. But the difficulty here was to make something which wouldn't blow up, that this would not, eventually the whole thing becomes black or the whole thing becomes white and it just flies apart. To make something that would hang together and manufacture these guys. So that's called a glider gun. Stephen Wolfram has been working for decades with these ideas, wrote a book called A New Kind of Science. He said, I think Isaac Newton got it wrong when he said that nature uses equations to make things, to make planetary orbits, etc. It's using rules the way we do in software. And so he explores a particular one-dimensional cellular automata, and this is one of 256 rules. Now, how complicated a thing can you make from these simple rules? So here's a simple formula. Who knows what I'm going to do next? So this is called a Mandelbrot set, developed by Mandelbrot, one of the people doing what I'm talking about. And you can zoom in on it, literally, infinitely. How far you can zoom is only limited by... The first time they did these, they did them with a pencil and graph paper. <laughs> they were really happy when they got computers. But we can zoom in on this infinitely, depending upon the power of your computer. So what this suggests to me is that if you wanted to make an oak tree, you would not stick a pole in the ground, nail sticks to the pole, and glue leaves to the sticks. What would you do? Plant an acorn, let the stupid oak tree make itself. Why are our, our cell phones are smart? Why can't they make themselves? Why have all these people with tweezers trying to let the stupid things make them? We can make a human being out of one cell. Why can't we make a, a smartphone? We can go much more complicated than glider guns. But the problem is this is in the computer. How do we get it out of the computer into quote unquote, the real world. And that's what Neil Gershenfeld's working on. So Gershenfeld pioneered at uh, the Center for Bits and Atoms at MIT's Fab Lab, what's called a Fab Lab. And we'll look at one in a minute. Think of a 3D printer. And again, a 3D printer is just the poster child for something about half the size of this room, but could then make anything. And we're going to see the significance of that in a moment. Now, to do this, he totally revolutionized computer science, rejecting Turing machines and von Neumann architecture, which is what we all use to this day, into a new kind of production which incorporates computation. The computation is in the material. So we do something on the computer, which sends it to the printer, which puts it on the paper. What if the paper did the whole thing? The acorn does the whole thing. There's no outside force telling an acorn what to do. It's all inside. And that's what he's doing. Think of Lego blocks, how they can be assembled, and part comes from the Lego block. You can't just do it, and it's telling you what to do by how it can fit together. Well, how far can you go with this? Well, he's now working with Airbus to make self-assembled jumbo jets. That's how far they go. And the point is, this changes everything. So in the industrial model, 
you go to school to get an education, to get a skill, to get a job, to make money, to buy what you need. What if you just 3D print what you need? Skip the whole thing. Everything changes. Just the way everything changed when we went from handcraft to industrial production, now it changes again. And 3D print is, again in quotes, because this is one of his fab labs, about half the size of this room and includes 3D printers, but other stuff. The city of Barcelona is doing it so that they want to stop importing stuff that they have to pay for and just make everything locally. And you imagine, how would you make a cell phone? How can a 3D printer make a chip with our phones today have 7 billion transistors on them? And it doesn't. The chip is one of the feedstock. And what he observes is, he says, if you go to an electronic supplier, they have 500,000 different capacitors. One is all you need. And you equip your feedstock with all the basic parts, and you can then self-assemble anything. Some of the people thinking this way, Carl Shu, who gives his students three genes, A, B, and C, at the beginning of the semester, by the end of the year, the building has grown itself. Alicia Andrasek, who is doing biological analogies of this approach. Elena Manfredini, who's applying this to both fashion and architecture. Peter McCapia, who's using flocking software for new kinds of geometry. Haresh Lalvani, this is his morphological universe. Now here, uh, columns just like this are in the permanent collection of Museum of Modern Art. And he makes the point that these curves do not come from the information for the curves, do not come from the machine. It's in the material. I'll tell you the secret, it's scored. But once you've done that, the information is done at telling the material how to fold is in the material, not coming from the outside. So we might imagine a metaphor to understand this world that <clears throat> the world and we are clusters of interconnected fractal networks computationally generating themselves and each other. And what I'm advocating is whole new ways of thinking, just the way whole new ways of thinking came about to make industrialization possible. So this is a book I just finished. I'm all excited. It's on Amazon already, uh, <clears throat> but it's not out till June 23rd. Monticelli is going to have a bazillion, 5,000 copies printed in China, and they're going to be stacked up somewhere. This is another book of mine. There are no copies anywhere. When you order it, they make it right then. And when you get your book two days later from Amazon, it says, manufactured March 3rd, 2020. And they ship it out the next day. So again, 3D printers are poster childs for this emerging world. But uh, Lockheed and Boeing are in competition with SpaceX. Lockheed and Boeing to make uh, rockets. <clears throat> Lockheed and Boeing have some whole supply chains to bring to them all the parts they need to make a rocket. SpaceX makes all their own. They need something, they 3D print it. This is a 3D, 3D printed rocket engine that can handle big stresses. And in terms of this new way of thinking, the Chevy Bolt is a very good car. Nobody buys it. Yeah, you've never seen one. You, know, you spot Teslas all over the place. Uh, why? General Motors makes cars, and then they put computers in them. That's not what Tesla does. Tesla makes, doesn't make computers. They make software and puts it in computers with wheels. So it's a totally different, even though it looks the same, it's a totally different product. It's a totally different way of thinking. In 1964, Marshall McLuhan said, light is information without content, and General Electric doesn't get it. They don't understand the business they're in. Finally, 
50 years later, they finally got it. And a former CEO, Jeff Umholt, said, you may not end up being a programmer, but you will know how to code. All new hires of GE have to be able to code. If they don't, they take a workshop and learn it. GE uses a platform called Predex, which is for, it's basically the industrial form of Windows. They are calling themselves a digital industrial company. What does that mean? Everything they, one of the things it means, everything they make, every windmill has a twin in the cloud. Starts to overheat. The twin in the cloud says, oh, we seem to be overheating. Should we call management? Checks with the other twins of other windmills and says, are you overheating? Yeah. When does that happen? Well, when the wind's over 55 miles an hour, maybe we should disengage the clutch. When I think, oh, okay. So they're all talking to each other. So what would the education be for this emerging digital genomic age? Not the Bauhaus education. One in which leaders in the field are guest faculty. We learn programming is a way of thinking, getting beyond Aristotle's five parts to an essay and thinking of what you can do in terms of relating unlimited ideas in the computer. Independent project, industrial collaborations. So these are the people I've been, about half of them I've met, uh, been bumping into at the conferences where I'm following this stuff. And I think they would make great visiting professors to come here. So Pratt can't compete with research universities and resources. These are the annual budgets of some schools, six to 10 billion a year. But it can compete in creativity. It's an example of that. Sebastian Thrun, who did Google Glass, self-driving car, Udacity, online university. Every year, DARPA and defense research would have a competition for self-driving cars. The military wanted these vehicles. And they would all take off, and within a half a mile, they'd all be in the ditch. So Thrun said, this is ridiculous. He put together $500,000, 15 Stanford students, and entered their car, and it drove the whole course. All the self-driving cars today are based on what these 15 people did. So creativity can be very powerful beyond uh, resources. So I'm envisioning a digital genomic world with new logics, new worldviews, new ways of making, new life trajectories. What you're going to do with your career totally changes. New social organization, new models of education, totally new ways of thinking. So my th thoughts about this are on my website, johnnobel.com. For years, I've had a website, Generative Genomics, which describes the basis of this. And I've been giving this lecture, of course, it's been changing, since 1969. And I always end it with this slide. Anybody know what that is? It says Xerox on a raw egg. And then I would say, why aren't we Xeroxing our cars? Now we are. So thank you.